Those terms, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Did you ever think that uh, as you minister to your children, you're ministering to Jesus? What a wonderful concept. Sometimes we think our kids get in the way of ministry when actually they might be our ministry at that point in time. Well, it's great to have some faces to look up to today. I heard them interviewing preachers on the radio this week, and they said, how do you like preaching to an empty room? And they said, we don't. We don't like it. I do appreciate the praise team and those people, the sound men and that have stayed. Yeah. They have stayed behind during this service, during the taping, to give me at least a, a few people to preach to. But uh, I'm glad to see uh, several more faces today in the sanctuary. And isn't it great to be back together again in the same room? Isn't that wonderful? I tell you, I missed it. I missed the assembling together. I'm thankful for our drive-in service. That has been a wonderful blessing through this time. But it's great to meet together in the same room too, isn't it? And I'm glad for technology. I'm glad that we have that option during these times. Well, Sue already said it, but I'd like to reiterate, Happy Mother's Day. How many mothers do we have here today? All right, we're here to honor you today. And I'd also like to include those who have uh, performed what we might call a maternal role. Uh, perhaps you don't have biological children, but... Uh, I know that I've had ladies in my life that have helped to form me, uh, particularly my Aunt Hazel, who's like an aunt, a mother, a grandmother, a neighbor, you name it, in my life. So those ladies, uh, she never had biological children, but she had a lot of kids. And so we want to honor those ladies today as well. Uh, Genesis 3.20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. How would you like to be able to say that? I'm the mother of all living creatures, of all human beings at least. Well, since the first mother, Eve, the one who began it all, mothers have impacted the world in a mighty way. You may have heard the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I hope that uh, you mothers here today realize the influence that you have and the ripple effect as you impact your families in those and then in turn your families impact other families and so on, how it goes. Uh, mothers have a remarkable ability to change the world and a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous re responsibility, not only through their own lives, but through the lives of their children and uh, those that their children influence. Like I say, it's a ripple effect. It goes on and on to eternity. You may have heard this quote, your greatest contribution to the world may be someone that you raise. That child of yours might make an impact that is, that is uh, well known and they might become famous or, or whatever, but uh, it all began with mother. Now there, there are many mothers in the Bible who, that teach us about a mother's influence. I've chosen four mothers today from the scriptures that exemplify four of the characteristics that we often associate with motherhood. The first one, we're going to call the protective mother. The protective mother. Now that might be redundant. Protective and mother. Anyway, her name is Jochebed. The protective mother, Jochebed. And we look in Exodus 2, starting with verse 1, a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman and she gave birth to a son. I'm summarizing here a little bit. Uh, when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. <laughs> that phrase kind of, it kind of struck me funny. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Now that's, that's not what you normally do with a fine child. You want to show them off. Speaking of that, some of you were here the first day that Carter came. I happened to be gone that day. I think we were at preacher's retreat or something. I didn't have the privilege to meet Carter until this morning. So John, would you hold up, in case there's anyone that hasn't met Carter Wilson, would you hold him up for us today? There he is, everybody. Aren't we glad to have him? Is this his second time? Yeah. Second time. I missed the first, but uh, we're glad. She had a fine child and she hid him for three months. Well, we'll explain why. <laughs> here, 
here in a little bit. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. You're ahead of me, aren't you? You know who this baby is, don't you? Uh, then she placed the child in it, put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Jochebed was trying to protect her baby, Moses, from the Egyptians. You see, they were slaves to the Egyptians, and they were becoming too numerous. They were becoming a threat to the Egyptians. And Pharaoh... Uh, set out to try to eliminate all the baby boys. And that's why Jochebed was hiding Moses. Uh, we see there in Exodus chapter 1, if you want to back up a little bit, why that was necessary. The Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Uh, then a new king came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. As I said, the Israelites had multiplied to the point where they were now becoming a threat. And the plan was to control the Hebrew population by killing all the Hebrew males. That's why Jochebed was protecting her baby. That's why she hid him for three months. And when it became impossible to hide him any longer... Have you, can you imagine trying to keep a three-month-old baby from crying? Trying to keep the three-month-old baby quiet so that no one could, would know that he was there? Um, that's why she was protecting him. Fortunately, uh, Exodus 1.20, the midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Well, Jochebed evidently thought her options were limited. Because who would ever think of taking your baby and putting them in a basket and hiding it in the river, in the reeds by the bank? I don't know what she thought was going to happen from that point, but that's what she did. She put him in a basket, placed him in the Nile, and trusted God. Now there's a key phrase. She was at the point where she had no other choice but to trust God with the baby's outcome. I hope that none of us have to get to that point before we trust God with our baby's outcome. His sister watched him from a distance to see what would happen. And then we see in Exodus 2, verse 7, Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. She saw the basket, opened it, saw the baby. He was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered, and the girl went and got the baby's mother. Hmm, this is working together pretty well here, isn't it? Pharaoh's daughter said, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. You think God doesn't have a plan? <laughs> Not only does she get to raise her own baby, but she gets paid for doing it. Wow. Moses' own mother became his nanny. Mothers who make a difference protect their children. They protect us physically by shielding us from danger. Proverbs 27, 12. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. Mothers have this ability to see danger ahead, off in the distance, and they often intervene on behalf of their children. Probably most of you have heard stories of, of mother humans and mother animals that have intervened on behalf of their children. Uh, babies, perhaps even to the point of death. They protect us morally and spiritually by teaching us right from wrong. Mothers are our first teachers. Mothers, be sure to teach your children the important things. Now, it's great to, to know all the things that uh, children need to know. That, I mean, just to be, live a productive life. I don't know what, 
what you would classify as in those essential things that need to be taught, but make sure, be intentional to teach them spiritual things, bedtime stories and prayers. You know, I went to a Christian university. I went through the course of study to be a minister. I've been in church all my life. I've been to revival services. I've been seminars, you name it. You know what the most, uh, what's the word, formative part of my life as far as spiritual things? Bedtime. Bedtime has had more impact on me spiritually than all of the writers and commentaries and preachers and evangelists and professors put together. The bedtime prayers, the bedtime stories. What a tremendous opportunity, what a tremendous privilege to impact the future through the life of your child. So pray with your children, pray for your children. Let your children hear you pray for them. I've come home from a date late at night, got out of my car, and while I was still in the yard, I could hear my mother praying inside the house. That's what I'm talking about. You'd have to walk over the prayers of your mother to go to hell. That's the kind of influence I'm talking about. Take advantage of it. You must be intentional about it because it's not going to happen automatically. If you're passive about it, it probably won't happen. You have to be intentional. Take them to church. Model the Christian life before them. Show them what a godly mother, a godly wife, a godly citizen, a godly neighbor looks like. They protect us more, I already said that one, they protect us emotionally by keeping us from things we're not mature enough to handle. Children shouldn't have to deal with adult issues. They need a buffer. They need a soft place to fall. They need an emotional shield, someone that they can go to and know that they'll find comfort and acceptance. The Apostle Paul understood this about motherhood. In 1 Thessalonians 2, he said, As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. Protection. Can a mother be too protective? Overprotective? Yes, absolutely. Sometimes parents try too hard. They do the best they know. They're well-meaning in the process. But they sometimes raise helpless, entitled children who seem to think the world revolves around them. Be careful in your protection. Where is that line? Where is that line between being protective and being overprotective? Well, that's a thing that you and God will have to work out where that line is. If your protection is crippling your child and keeping them from maturing and becoming the person they were intended to be, if your protection is smothering them, if it's causing them to be rebellious, then you've crossed that line. There comes a time when we must allow children to experience the consequences of their choices. Sometimes we call it tough love. Parenting is complicated. But fortunately, we have the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and some very wise authors to guide us, to help us along the way. For me, it was James Dobson. He's probably my hero as far as family and child rearing and those sort of things, James and Dobson. But the good news is, children are amazingly resilient and they can survive a whole lot of parenting mistakes as long as they know they're loved. Jochebed was a protective mother. Secondly, the supportive mother, Hannah. We're going to call Hannah a supportive mother. In 1 Samuel 1, verse 24, after he was weaned, she's talk, it's talking about Samuel, she took the boy with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, the priest, and she said to him, 
As surely as you live, my Lord, I'm the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him, so now I give him to the Lord. Figuratively speaking, right? I mean, no, literally. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and, she worsh and he worshipped the Lord there, and Hannah went back home. Whoa. That's unusual. That would go against what you would think a mother's instinct would be to bring their, their child to the priest and leave him there. Well, maybe you probably remember the story. She had prayed for a son for many years. In fact, she made a promise to the Lord there in uh, 1 Samuel 1.11. She made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you'll obey... If you'll only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. God finally gave her a son, and she fulfilled that promise. She gave him to the Lord. He was taken to the Lord's house, left with the priest to become a servant of the Lord. And Hannah continued to support him in the Lord's work. She took her hands off. She was supportive, but she allowed her son to become what God had called him to be. She wanted a child so badly that she made a deal with God. If you'll give me a child, I'll give him back to you. Once the Lord answered her, can you imagine how difficult that would have been to follow through on that commitment? How many would have followed through after they made that promise? and walked away and left their child there in the house of the Lord. What would you say if I said that every one of us should do the same? Not literally. I'm not saying that you should take your child and, and dump them on the church doorstep and drive off. You may have wanted to a time or two, but I'm not talking literally. I'm talking figuratively. We should give our children back to the Lord to use as He sees fit. We should support our children in doing the Lord's will even when it's not easy. What if the Lord called your child to be a missionary and it took your child and all your grandkids across an ocean? That's what I'm talking about. Dr. Clarence Sexton said giving a child to God means to desire what the Lord desires for that child. We must take our hands off and turn them loose for God's will and purpose. What if your child's called to be a preacher? Preacher don't, preachers don't make that much money. I thought maybe my child might be a doctor or a lawyer or something, you know. This is to continue all their lives, still quoting here, this is to continue all their lives as we honestly and sincerely believe that God's will and way is best. We've got to believe that down deep in our heart because it's true. We naturally feel possessive of our children, that's normal, but we must remember they belong to God. They're placed in our care and keeping for a while. Giving our children to God may begin with a simple act of dedication, but it must be a continuous act of surrendering them to the will of God all the days of their lives. Hannah embodies that in a very literal sense in our passage today. I went back over the dedication ceremony that we have in our manual when someone comes forward to dedicate their baby to the Lord. And I wonder if, if, if most of them really realize the magnitude of the commitment they're making at that point in time. Here's what the ceremony says. In presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that he or she may early know and follow the will of God, may live and die a Christian and come unto everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it will be your duty as a parent or guardian to teach him or her early the fear of the Lord, to watch over his or her education that he or she be not led astray. 
to direct his or her youthful mind to the Holy Scriptures and his or her feet to the sanctuary, to restrain him or her from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you lies to bring him or her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what parents say when they bring their children to the front of the sanctuary to dedicate them. Jochebed was a protective mother. Hannah was a supportive mother. And Eunice was an instructive mother. Eunice. You don't hear too many people named Eunice nowadays. It's one of those old names. And old names come back around every so often. Eunice changed the world through her child. You probably remember the name of her child, Timothy. There's a book in the Bible, two books in the Bible, named after her child. Do you think she impacted the world? You better believe it. 2 Timothy 1, starting with verse 1, Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded now lives in you also. See, that's how it works. Faith is like a baton. You pass it along to the next generation. And if a baton is dropped, it's most likely to be dropped in the transfer. Timothy had a faithful grandmother. He had a faithful mother who transmitted that faith on to him. Timothy became a close friend of the Apostle Paul and accompanied him in his missionary journeys. Paul relied on Tim Timothy a great deal. Timothy's faith had been passed from his grandmother to his mother to him. They were examples. They taught him scripture. They modeled the Christian life before them, before him. And like I said earlier, you have to be intentional about passing the faith. Teach them about Jesus. Tell them the Bible stories. Tell them your stories, your personal testimony. How did you come to know the Lord? How has the Lord delivered you through your trials? My parents were old enough that I heard the Great Depression stories firsthand. As a child, growing up, I heard how God delivered my mom and dad through the Great Depression. You think the coronavirus is bad. You ought to hear some of those stories. Tell them your story. It becomes a part of their legacy. And if God can do it for you, then He can do it for me. It increases their faith. Teach them the songs of the faith. I don't know what the popular characters are nowadays on TV. When Bo was little, it was Barney. <laughs> Anybody remember Barney? Anybody trying to forget Barney? <laughs> A purple dinosaur. Who comes up with these ideas? Of course, Bo wouldn't ever admit to watching Barney because Barney was not cool. Barney was for nerds. Whatever character it is on TV, we learn the nursery rhymes and we learn the jingles and the songs and all those kinds of things, Sesame Street or whatever it is. That's all fine. Just make sure they know the important stuff. Take them to church. Use Sunday school, VBS, children's church, quizzing, every tool you can possibly use, but don't abdicate your parental responsibility to anyone else. The responsibility is yours. What a privilege. What a noble calling. If you're called to be a mother, why would you want to stoop to anything else? Tony Campolo was popular a few years back. You don't hear a lot about him nowadays, but he said he'd go to these uppity rich people kind of banquets and stuff, and these lawyers and doctor ladies would come and they'd ask his wife, what does she do? Well, she was a stay-at-home mom. And this was her reply. I am socializing two homo sapiens in the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be instruments for the transformation of the social order. What do you do? And when they said lawyer, it wasn't all that impressive. <laughs> There's no greater calling than mother. 
Jochebed was a protective mother, Hannah was a supportive mother, Eunice was an instructive mother, and Mary was a loyal mother. Again, I think I'm being redundant. Loyal and mother. John 19, 16, Pilate handed him, Jesus, over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into the four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And verse 25 is what I want to draw out here. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. Do you think that was easy? She was there at the beginning from the very annunciation when the angel told her that she would bear a son and she said, may it be to me as you have said. She was there at the beginning and here she was at the end. It would have been easier to run like the other apostles. It would have been easier to hide her head, hide her eyes, be somewhere else. She had seen her son beaten, ridiculed, crucified, and now the soldiers gambled to see who would get his clothing, and there she was. Loyal to the end. No matter what their children do, no matter what they go through, mothers are loyal. They don't give up. Now this does not mean that they condone or approve of their children's sin. It does not necessarily mean there's, a, there's not ever a time for tough love. But it does mean that they are loyal and that they continue to love and wish the best for their children. John Killinger said it this way, I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born to a virgin named Mary. I believe in the love Mary gave her son, which caused her to follow him in his ministry and stand by his cross as he died. I believe in the love of all mothers and its importance in the lives of the children they bear. It's stronger than steel, softer than down. It closes wounds, melts disappointments, enables the weakest child to stand tall and straight in the fields of adversity. I believe that this love, even at its best, is only a shadow of the love of God. If you can imagine how much a mother loves. You've heard someone say, he's got a face only a mother could love. Well, that's kind of humorous, it's kind of sad. But it illustrates that a mother's love is considered the pinnacle. But the Old Testament tells us, even if a mother deserts you, God will not. That God's love is even beyond that. Quoting, and I believe that one of the most beautiful sights in the world is a mother who lets this greater love, the greater love of God, flow through her to her child. To the moms who protected us, supported us, instructed us, and were loyal to us, we say a great big thank you. And if you still have your mothers, I would suggest that you do that before it's too late. To the young mothers who are still raising their children or are yet to raise their children, protect your kids, but not too much. Support them. Teach them in the ways of the Lord and remain loyal to them. God bless our mothers. Shall we stand?